right, hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed that little bit of Canadiana that was uh, uh, the music in the opening credits. I'd like you to welcome you to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the artistic director for the festival and I'm delighted to present um, this afternoon's event, Making Mischief, the Trickster Trilogy. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I am situated this afternoon is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We hope you've followed the sponsorship acknowledgement video that was playing before the event started. I'd like to thank the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Councils for their ongoing support of the festival. We are grateful to all the organizations and individuals who support us. For this event in particular, I would like to thank um, the Governor General's Literary Awards for sponsoring this and Ian Coots and Catherine Lyon Kings who are author patrons for Eden Robinson. Uh, this event is an hour long. I know we started a little bit late, but we've got a little wiggle room at the end. So um, you will have time for questions. Um, and there is a Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions at any point during the event, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box and they will be answered by the moderator. There's also the option to raise your hand. You'll see a little raise your hand function at the bottom. Or if you're on your phone, you can press star nine and um, that will give us uh, the ability to see you and unmute you to ask a question when it's your turn. As a thank you to you for continuing to support Kingston Writers Fest and joining us for the virtual edition of the festival, we will randomly select a pre-registered participant of this event following our Q&A to win a copy of Eden's amazing new book. Um, we're doing this for each onstage event, so there's one more to go after this. Um, now I am delighted to introduce this event's interviewer, Trisha Knowles. Trisha is a cultural curator, festival and event producer, and arts promoter with a certificate in cultural planning and development from the University of British Columbia. A passionate reader, Trisha has been part of the Kingston Writers Fest team for many years, including six years as marketing director. She is one of the founding members and artistic director of Calliope Collective which is committed to creative placemaking and cultivation of a sense of wonder and produces events that strive to connect people with the elements and cycles of nature. Trisha is also a creative, a stilt walker, body painter, aspiring herbalist, and delights in the mischievous. Please welcome Trisha Knowles. Thank you so much, Era. I definitely do delight in the mischievous. Lynn, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the land acknowledgement. I would like to add that as a Mi'kmaq settler, I am personally grateful to be a guest on this land of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. I honor all of the ancestors who took care of this land for us to continue to enjoy its bounty and those who continue to care for it now. As Era mentioned, each of us are responsible and every one of us needs to be a steward of Mother Earth, no matter where we come from or where we end up. There is also a significant Métis community, as well as First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. And I am incredibly grateful to join you on this land. And with that, I would like to introduce you to one of the more twisted, dark, yet hilarious voices I have had the privilege to read over the past couple of years. I would like to uh, let you know in advance that during this conversation, there will be mention of residential schools, self-harm, substance abuse, and intergenerational trauma. Heisla Heltzuk novelist Eden Robinson is the author of Traplines, a collection of novellas written back when she was a brooding emo goth, which won the Winifred Holtby Prize in the UK. Her novel Monkey Beach won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize and was a finalist for the Giller Prize and the Governor General's Award for Fiction. In 2017, Eden was awarded the Writers' Trust Fellowship. 
The first book in this series, Son of a Trickster, became the finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and Canada Reads. Trickster Drift, the second book in the trilogy, my personal favorite, won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize. And with the release of this third and final book in this brilliant and captivating Trickster trilogy, Eden joins us from her home 500 miles north of Vancouver in the rainforest of Kitimat Village, BC, to chat with us about shapeshifters, witches, sulkies, ghosts, dolphin universes, irritating fireflies, and so much more. Please welcome Eden Robinson. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Hello, y'all. Yeah. Uh, how are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. I should mention, <laughs> I actually said, I'm going to quote here. Her next novels, Monkey Beach and Blood Sports, were written before she discovered she was gluten intolerant. And <laughs> the latter being especially gruesome because halfway through writing it, Robinson gave up a two pack a day cigarette habit. And the more she <laughs> suffered, the more her characters suffered. Okay, so I'm not sure how much more you can make the character suffer than to have your protagonist organs crawling around independently, but apparently you are the mastermind of this. <laughs> my, my, uh, the book that I was writing uh, when I quit smoking was Blood Sports, and my family loves me. I know they love me because they buy all my books. <laughs> But, you know, none of them made it through, uh, like, blood sports. They said, we love you, but, you know, we just can't do this. And uh, you can see in the novel, like, uh, where it switched, where I was a happy smoker to a, you know, a very reluctant non-smoker. Uh, so around page 100, there's a 40-page torture scene. <laughs> And, then and, that was, <laughs> and that was written at the absolute depths of uh, my withdrawal. Like I had been a two packer, like I tried to quit smoking 17 times. Uh, I tried everything. I tried like the gum, the patch, Champex, uh, <laughs> you know, hypnotherapy, <laughs> acupuncture, you know. And the 17th time was June 1st, 2004. And it was pure cold turkey. It was just, <laughs> there was a three month period where I was just grumpy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't, yeah, you know, I kind of quit out of vanity. Um, my doctors were talking about uh, oxygen tanks. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> and it inspired some really dark, wonderful processing writing. And, I know that there's yeah. a lot written into this series about dealing with substance abuse. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, mm -hmm. but I wondered if you would do us the honor of uh, reading a little bit about these, this protagonist organs crawling around independently. Could you trickster? I would love to. This is the opening chapter of Return of the Trickster. And it starts, off about four hours after Jared has returned to our universe. <laughs> the IV drip cold into Jared Martin's arm, a remarkably grounding sensation, failing. He remembered the nurse telling him he was dehydrated and that he kept throwing up the water they gave him. Bile scorched the back of his throat. An unseen ambulance warbled growing louder. The lights were achingly bright. The hospital mattress was firm against his back and the pale curtains surrounding his bed were shut. Through these fabric walls, he could hear other patients in the Kitimat General Hospital emergency ward murmuring with their families, friends, lovers. A scream cut through the quiet as electric doors swooshed open somewhere near, bringing the smell of rain then closed. Voices shouted information and instructions at each other as a lone male voice howled, guttural. He shivered. Nausea hit again, Jared's stomach cramped. The nurse had given him a little cardboard container for his vomit, but it was full and pungent, reeking on the medical table. Jared slid off the bed. The floor was cold against his bare feet. He yanked off the clear tape that held the ivy in place and carefully pulled out the needle. 
The other bed curtains were shut, but through the gaps he could see other patients listening intently as another male voice joined the first. He made it out to the corridor where he watched two men fight three of the paramedics to grapple with each other. A security guard ran past Jared as the men threw punches but landed with earnest thugs. Jared covered his mouth as he started to hew. He opened the heavy bathroom door and threw up into the toilet. Blood, bright red against the white enamel, diffused in tendrils in the water, copper in his mouth. The muscles in his throat clenched and released until he threw up again, this time a stew of blood and chunks. His stomach burned, a hot pain, like accidentally swallowing a live coal. The searing intensified until it was as if he'd swallowed the whole barbecue pit. Oh God, Jared thought, I'm dying. He could hear police sirens in the distance. He hurled and could feel large firm masses working their way up his throat, blocking his breathing. Dizziness hit as he fought for air. He crawled towards the door, spewing strange sacks of flesh, bloody and self-contained. Shapes his biology classes led him to guess for organ, a spleen maybe, a kidney. Jared tried to scream, but it came out as a gurgle as he puked again. He felt his intestine shift and then an intense urge to defecate. God, he thought, oh God, Jared? Not God, only the voice of his biological father we get. The transforming ravens was speaking to him as magical beings speak to one another sharing thoughts. The insanity of the magic Jared had unleashed had left him with no way to deny he was a trickster himself and that he was part of the crazy that his amateur dabbling had created the shitstorm that eventually landed him here in Emerge again. All his relationships changed now, except the rotten one he had with his bio dad. Normally, Jared would tell him to um, fudge right off, <laughs> but his organs were running amok in the hospital bathroom and he had no pride left. Please help me. <sighs> you pushed your way, you pushed, way past the magical limits <laughs> oh my god you've pushed way past the limits of your magical ability you lumbering dolt we get thought of him stop blubbering and call your damn organs back to your body i don't know how pretend it's a dream will your organs back into your body will your blood and guts to behave you're the boss make them listen to you he still couldn't breathe the part of him that didn't want to admit he was something other than a regular human fought the part of him that wanted to live at any cost. Fear metallic in his mouth, humming through his body, making him shake. He wanted to be whole. He wanted himself back together and he fought through his own panic and finally made a connection to the bits of him that had escaped. An awareness like knowing that someone was near you in the dark. Like a film in reverse, his blood streamed back into him and disappeared when it touched his skin. The organs, naked, shiny, and slick, continued to roll across the industrial gray floor, while two of them splashed in the toilet like children in a kiddie pool. He touched the organs near him and they tried to wiggle free, but were absorbed back into his body, where they fluttered beneath his skin and then went quiet. He grimaced at the two organs swimming in the toilet bowl. You're dreaming, he told himself. Just touch them, you big baby. They were chilly to the touch, but obeyed. It was not so nice to feel them moving inside him. He slid to the floor, muscles spasming in rolling clusters. He hugged himself. The blood on his hospital again disappeared. From the corner of his eye, he caught a movement. He turned his head slowly and saw a triangle-shaped deep red blob of his flesh sprout tiny legs, tiny arms, and a tiny misshapen head. His liver transformed into a little person, the head budding ears and newborn eyes fused shut blind, the toes and fingers fused together in frog-like fans fully separating. Oh my god, he thought. He crept across the floor despite his stealth, his liver saw him coming. He willed it back but it hid behind the toilet, the head expanding, the arms and legs lengthening until it looked like a fetus. Jared lunged and caught it by one plump arm. The mouth opened, but no sound came out. Jared hugged his liver baby, willing it to stop right now. A wave of yearning hit him. 
an endless curiosity to see the world and not be imprisoned in Jared's torso, doing the same thing day after day after day. I'm not having this conversation with you, Jared told it. You aren't a person. You're my liver. His poor, <laughs> poor liver. <laughs> He does test his liver a lot. <laughs> oh, and and I, I appreciated the edit that you threw in there, but I believe he said, no, he thought, oh, holy fucking God. <laughs> I, I appreciate the censorship, but that was such a great line because that's what I would be thinking. And, and I have mentioned with, with the substance abuse too, like this, this kid's poor liver i mean he goes yeah. through this journey of sobriety um throughout the second uh book in the series yeah. and uh i love how <laughs> you have made this poor organ um i just wanted to to bring back because we do have some people in the audience who may have not read the entire series yet uh. but the the bio dad being the trickster and obviously this is uh, the center of the story uh, jared the mm. protagonist one of 535 children to be born to the trickster we get and the trickster is is a common stock character in folklore it's a, a clever yeah. mischievous person or a creature and through the use of trickery, sometimes simply for amusement, sometimes for survival, uh, the trickster achieves their goals. But I think that mm -hmm. the trickster also is this personification of, of the chaos that the world needs to function. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how that relates to we get versus say other tricksters within <laughs> mythology and legends like we did i mean we there's there's a big difference there um, so i wonder if you could just take us through a little bit about the legend of the trickster uh, as you know it and and the approach mm -hmm. that you were coming at it from mm -hmm. uh well i have a very specific trickster in mind when i talk about tricksters because i'm from the northwest coast of british columbia I, I uh, uh, you know, both of my families potlatch, but we potlatch very differently. Uh, we both have tricksters who perform more or less the same function, but there are de varying details about their relationship with the different groups. Uh, so from Alaska down to Washington, along the coast, there are about 30 different nations that potlatch. And um when you know they all have tricksters uh, not all of them are ravens uh the further south you go it, it starts to turn into minks or you know there are many different uh creatures that shape shift uh tricksters are just one of them um but you know the trickster performed many functions in our society like our society was built on the potlatch. Like everything was structured around our ceremonies. And um, so we have a, a series of oral stories, oral, you know, um, and those stories belonged in different categories. The first category would be the formal stories. Mm -hmm. So anything that had anything that touched ceremony would go into the formal category. Um, this was like our culture was incredibly hierarchical. Um, uh, if you were if you were given a very big name, then that name came with rights and responsibilities. Um, one of your responsibilities was to know all the stories that belonged to that name, because you weren't the owner of that name; you were the caretaker. Uh, that name had been caretaken by people in your family for many, many, many generations. So as a child, you would learn those stories verbatim so that when you grew up to accept the name at your coming of age potlatch, you would be able to recite those stories verbatim as they had been handed down to you. Um, that comes with like if there is, uh, if there's two people vying for the same name, like if, if like the chief of chiefs is the Jesse, 
uh, if there were two people vying for Jesse, then you know it would come down to the genealogy, their fitness for the for the role, and of course, like how well they knew the stories. So at the Paulet, there would be people who knew the stories because we've heard them many many times, um, and you know what if I wanted to tell any of those formal stories, uh, you know, that would fall, those ones fall under our traditional high of copyright. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, much like if you were using a story that like a, a piece that someone else wrote, you'd have to go to the publisher and ask permission from the author uh, with the formal stories within Paul culture. Uh, to use any of those, I would have to go to my chief. Uh, I would, I get, well, I took it off with my, my Muji, the, the high lady of our clan, mm -hmm. and ask permission to ask permission from their Muji <laughs> <laughs> to ask permission mm -hmm. with the per, to the person, clan, or family that owned that story. And I would have to provide payment. And, payment in highs the copyright is a potlatch. So potlatches are like a cross between a large wedding and a large conference. Mm -hmm. So when you attach your business to someone else's potlatch, it requires the like UN level diplomacy. Incorporating <laughs> in the informal and the casual stories category. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all, all the all the trickster stories, well, most of the trickster stories fall in the informal category okay. where um, these are stories that are in the highest law public domain. Uh, the, all the Wigget stories, most of the Sasquatch stories, like all the stories that were meant to teach children are noyam are in the highest law public domain. Mm -hmm. And the casual, the casual oral stories are the ones that most people tell about their family. Like, you know, I was telling you about my my auntie doll who went to a wedding in Prince Rupert and they were driving home and you know she was tired of her girdle so she took it off and threw it out the window and it landed on the windshield of the cop car behind them. <laughs> so that's you know those are the kind of family lore that you know it's not official but it's just something that you know tells you about the you know uh you know, your family, their funny family mm -hmm. stories or serious family stories. Uh, so within the high school culture, like I grew up hearing bigot stories. Um, uh, and most of my family are storytellers. They're, you know, very good at it. So when they would get together after dinner, you know, smoking and having coffee, uh, when you get at those storytellers together, they just roll, they rip. You know, they try to one out each other. It's exciting. It's it's a lot of fun. It's uh, and that's the kind of energy I wanted in my books. Like you know, well, that, you, can that, really, you can see the characters in the book, like sitting around the table, having these types of conversation, and really how you've woven in so much of what's indicative of life within Indigenous community. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because you mentioned the Sasquatch. And I didn't mention that in my introduction. <laughs> the character that pops up in, in the third book. And there is the introduction of, of a handful of new characters. And I'm curious as to what caused you in an already very character driven series, what caused you to add more characters in the third book and to really enhance the roles of those characters who were previously on the sidelines within the first two? Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, in, in the first rough edits where I, <laughs> I subscribed to the vomit method of writing <laughs> where you just, you know, pour everything onto the page and then organize it later. <laughs> when you're moving from your rough draft to your first draft, like mm -hmm. you pull everything apart and look at what you have. Kind of like when you're gold panning and you have like uh, just a bunch of like, you know, stuff and you carefully sift through it and you see the gold. So 
the, you know, what is gold depends on your narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, so the narrative drive for Return of the Trickster was very different from the one for Trickster Drift, and it was very different from Son of the Trickster. Um, so, you know, in in the final book, uh, there were <laughs> there's about three or four hundred more pages <laughs> where we get like a like a detailed um, exploration of uh, like the the otters, like they had their own subplot and you know the the process of Jared making peace with them. Uh, now that his father has passed and you know what he would like you know what kind of relationship they have going forward uh that did not serve the narrative of return of the trickster so all that went mm -hmm. um you know there was a there was a there was also a subplot with uh coda um you know except like his like he's met this guy named elijah and you know with his with coda's particular past he has trouble. Um, he is an avoidant personality. He does not like anytime he gets close to people, he freaks out because he's, you know, he knows that they're going to leave him. Uh, so, you know, there was a big subplot about, you know, Elijah and Coda and, you know, the, and, you know, all that went. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's little bits of it left. And it was hard to let them go because, you know, I, I really care about like every everyone in the books, like the Koi Wolves, Georgina, we get and Nina, Maggie, you know, but in such uh, a peopled universe, I had to decide like which parts of which stories fit Jarrett's narrative. Uh, and that was, you know, so that was a process of I'm um, pulling things in, pulling them out. Um, and then letting them sit for a bit so that I could gain some distance. Mm -hmm. uh, you, <laughs> I'm that close. I love everything. <laughs> you take the characters out all together because there there are a lot. I mean, you've got the otters and the ghosts, and I mean, obviously the trickster and this yeah. cannibalistic ogress and. <laughs> and, and um, the Selkies, I want to read an entire series about the Selkies. <laughs> so there, there are a lot on that. And I wondered, like, how how did you reconcile with keeping so many different types of supernatural beings within the same storyline without getting so sidetracked off onto their own individual narratives? Uh, that's where your editor comes in handy. Uh <laughs> <laughs> because uh, they're they're more uh, clear-eyed about like when you are emotionally attached to characters, it's hard to see them clinically, um, and until you get to that point, you can't really deal with them. So, mm -hmm. when your editor is telling you that I just love the scene with like like his little cousins, like. Uh, who are hackers and you know eventually they're gonna work with Microsoft. You know, they're they're wonderful, but they do nothing for the narrative. Like they're, you know, they're funny and they're interesting, but it's like 10 pages that take you away from um, you know, it, it's in in such a people's universe, it's you know, we haven't seen them for a long time. Mm -hmm. When they come back, you know, they're their journey isn't mirroring mirroring jared's journey yeah uh, and oh my god i can't talk today because i mean you go through so many different narratives too like this the structure yeah. of this series bounces between narrators and mm -hmm. There, there's this really interesting concept where I know it took me a moment and I was like, what, what's happening here? Why, why am I all of a sudden in a character's head? What? Oh, oh, okay. Now, now I get it. But what, what caused you to do it? What made you structure the book like that when you were, hmm, I need to completely switch the point of view from, mm -hmm. from this storytelling. So we'll go from away from the main story and now all of a sudden you're in Jared 
mom, I don't want to do spoilers. I was going to say Jared. <laughs> Jared's mom's <laughs> Maggie's head, but I don't think we should go there because that'll spoil the book. Um, but I, maybe without talking about the plot. Um, oh. What, what caused you to want to let us see in, inside them so deeply? Uh, yeah, well, I myself am a terrible spoiler. So I will, I, you know, when my family watches TV shows with me, uh, when I was still on Facebook, they would like, they would block me until they had seen the episode, the latest episode of like Game of Thrones. Cause you know, I go, guess what Cersei did? Uh <laughs> well, that's just mean. <laughs> Eat in. And that was the consensus. <laughs> I just, you know, it's like, um, uh, like I am a geeky super fan when it comes to things that I like, so I want to share it immediately, and I need to talk to people. Uh, and um, uh, wait, where was I going? Uh, <laughs> you told us why we were seeing inside. Oh, the, the multiple, the multiple, the multiple heads. Well, you know, um, when you're a writer, you have a certain toolbox and some of the skills in the toolbox you're very good at like i i uh, i've i've worked really hard on my dialogue uh menacing mood and uh characters uh i am i am less good at like erotica <laughs> plot <laughs> and multiple points of view so most of my stories have been told from first person or third person limited and you know, there are many, many stories I can tell from those points of view, but there are some uh, community stories that are much harder to tell from a singular point of view. Uh, for instance, I've been trying to write a trashy band council romance forever. And that story demands to be told through multiple narrators. Mm -hmm. So in preparation for writing the trashy band council romance, um, I, I started reading a lot of books with multiple narrators and it affected the, the third book that I was writing at the time uh, because, you know, I started slipping into other characters' heads as, as the writer. And uh, within the universe of the Trickster series, like uh, Jared can share consciousness and thoughts with other magical beings. Uh, and that presented me with an opportunity to explore different points of view through like through this ability. And it was so much fun. Uh, it was it was it was hard to uh, to corral all the narratives that wanted to get into the story. But there were some that were particularly helpful. And uh, I think Maggie and Sarah, like the the moments where um, telling telling that particular part of the book from their point of view was, I, I think, essential because of that point. Like that was when Jared had broken and he was at one of his lowest points. So, you know, he didn't really want to be the narrator at that point. He wanted to be anywhere but in his own head. Yeah, yeah. And I think that um, just for, for those who are new to the series, uh, Sarah is is the girlfriend-ish and Maggie. <laughs> and, um, I think uh, a lot like your, your own personal story, if I can kind of take this back, just you mentioned Maggie and I, I really wanted mm. to get into her story. She's, she's one of mm. uh, the most compelling characters in this mm. series. For me, she is so deeply wounded and mm -hmm. uh, I think like you, Jared, uh, being the first generation who didn't go to residential school within the story, his mom being, I think it was the third generation who did. And I'm wondering how that compares to your own story, how much of, of your life mm -hmm. on the res and through school in Vancouver bleeds into those characters. But, mm -hmm. but also, you mentioned within the story, um, there, there are two grandmother characters within the story and the juxtaposition between these two grannies is amazing. Um, <laughs> one is just throwing money all over the place and the other um, is Anita, who is connected very closely with We Get the Trickster. And um, you had mentioned that very briefly, 
and and I love that you wove this in uh, in such a clever fashion of how deeply impacted she was from her experiences at mm -hmm. residential school and the process that she had to go through with the Truth and Reconciliation Committee to tell her story, to be heard, to have a voice, but that it, it just didn't feel worth it reopening those wounds. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder mm -hmm. how this, this storyline that goes that really woven beautifully throughout the three books relates to, to your own experience and how much of your own kind of, how much of that is autobiographical, like um, graphical, excuse mm -hmm. me, in, in your, mm -hmm. your lineage? Well, um, my mother's Celtic and my dad is Hydra. And I'm the first generation that didn't go to residential school. Like everyone, all my cousins that are older than me went to residential school. Uh, I went to two Indian day schools. I went to the Bella Bella day school and the Kitimat Village day school. So the entirety of my life has been impacted by the, you know, by the rippling effects of the residential school system. Uh, so when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about complex trauma. Um, but, you know, simple trauma would be your house burning down. Complex trauma would be your town burning down. And intergenerational trauma would be, you know, your town burning down like every five or 10 years. So, you know, what you need to recover from simple trauma is, is easily handled by support systems. So when you have complex trauma and complex intergenerational trauma, and when the wider society is not supporting you, uh, then, you know, then you start to get into uh, like addictions because people need to cope with the things that they've experienced. And the things that, you know, when I grew up, nobody wanted to hear about the residential school. Like there was, there was such a shift in consciousness with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. Like after that, um, the conversation widened. Uh, whereas, you know, before 2015, it was something that, uh, like I had watched like, family members who were so deeply impacted and so wounded and they were so um, angry and hurt and they just lashed out and the people who paid the most for it were their family. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that I witnessed like was that they really didn't have anywhere to go for support. They didn't have, like uh, they didn't have access to anything um, and they still rebuild themselves they still rebuild their lives they still you know they made peace with their families and you know so it was you know it was just amazing uh, and I'm still in awe of their strength because you know all the people who worked you know who work at the grassroots and who are doing the things that make the huge difference in our society. Like, you know, they went through the same complex intergeneral, intergenerational trauma as everybody else. Uh, but, you know, they've not only done the work for themselves and their family, they're, they're doing it for not just the community, but for, you know, for the entire society and that, is what I wanted to put into fiction. Like I wanted to show that journey. Like, and you know, for me it's it's intimately tied with like our our the universe that we have. The as as coastal people, as Haisla people, as Celtic people, um, you know, accepting our supernatural creatures as they are within our context and then integrating them into the present. That for me, that was, uh, that was so important. That was wildly hard. <laughs> uh, and, 
but it was, you know, it was a lot of fun because they're, you know, and that is how we dealt with like a lot of trauma. Uh, you know, it is that very dark sense of humor. Uh, it's the gallows humor. It's the, uh, and the way people come together and fall apart and come together. Um, Which they do a yeah. lot through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and fall apart and come together <laughs> and fall apart or be taken apart um yeah i mean it is it is dark i mean it's yeah and and i meant what i said like it's brilliantly dark in that you have these moments where you're reading and your heart is just sinking and it's heavy and it's introspective and and jared is tearing himself apart he's in this place of self-discovery and trying to break these cycles and and do more with his life and it's just, just weighed it down and weighed it down and then you will say something so completely or write something so completely absurd <laughs> that you go from like crying and heaviness to crying and like snotty laughing <laughs> <laughs> this is a very uh, that, that that deadpan humor mixed with just <laughs> complete absurdity. Where do, where does this humor come from? Because I oh, laugh that, a lot through these. Things. <laughs> <laughs> too. That is that is completely family. That is yeah. uh, that is you know uh, I'm actually this shy, quiet one in my family. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we laugh, so we get we, you know before, in the before times we would constantly get kicked out of restaurants and movie theaters and events. You know we're just loud, and <laughs> <laughs> so my father's side that's where the dry, deadpan sense of humor. That's you know that's that's where my dad's side and my mom's side is just you know uh their sense of humor is is a lot more um you know robust it's 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 louder and uh yeah no it's just that, that is you know that is the way uh my family you know that's that's a, like a, a family sense of humor well and it's really a coping mechanism as well mm -hmm. yes yeah alcoholism and you know avoidant casual sex and um <laughs> coughing and there's, there are some other self-harm but it is yeah. also a lot of yeah. laughter throughout yeah. these stories and just the characters laughing at themselves or being so absurdly annoying okay i have to ask so <laughs> It's, I mean, I don't know if it's a spoiler so much, but Jared gets increasingly annoying. <laughs> what, what, like, what caused you to like, just really drive that home? I mean, you were like, at least you didn't get that he was an irritating little SOB. Let me point out in, you know, repeatedly, he just gets yeah. really stupid throughout. Like, he's just, just this yeah. dense kid where you kind of think in the first couple of books, especially how he deals with food security and, and like stretching meals and, and that, the issues of hunger and all of these things, he's very clever and witty and doing all these yeah. things, but then he's really, really dense. <laughs> what, what's going on? Like, what happened with <laughs> Uh, what happens with Jared is that he doesn't want to deal with reality as it is. It's gotten too complex. It's gotten too hard. There is no decision that he can make that will make things better. Uh, no matter what he does, it's going to get harder. And, you know, he's dealing with that the way, you know, a, a kid that's acting out will, will deal with it. So he's fallen back on the things that gave him comfort. He's falling back on very old ways of dealing with the world. So, you know, when he was back in Kitimat, when he was going through uh, his party stage, you know, uh, one of the coping mechanisms was to become the class clown. Mm -hmm. Like, so he was, he was very, he was very amusing. You know, he brought the drugs, he brought the cookies. Uh, and that was, you know, that was so, 
in the third book when everything is coming down on him and people are dying, like people that he loves. Uh, Dark people universes are disappearing. Yeah, yeah, you know the you know his world is collapsing, and he just doesn't want to deal with it anymore, and he doesn't want to see anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know he's he's doing a lot of things to to avoid, uh, you know, the consequences of his own decisions. Mm -hmm. And you know I think that you know having characters be as messy as their human counterparts um, is you know is you know telling truth with a slant like I, I don't think that there's a single human being on the earth that is uh, good and functional all the time I think you know we have our moments <laughs> and this, is, this is an extreme moment for Jared and he's acting with extreme messiness mm -hmm. and you know and it can be incredibly irritating because the path forward is pretty obvious mm -hmm. but he doesn't want to go there because it's going to hurt a lot yeah and it's it's interesting because the relationship between jared and his mom maggie really make this mm -hmm. so abundantly clear that he's just infuriating and you know, she's constantly telling him that he is the most annoying human. She's <laughs> you're, you're he's, he's, he's also a trickster. So there, there. It's, it's kind of it's kind of his job to be annoying. Um, they're they're terms of endearment for each other. Um, Hallmark because his mom says such really. Uh, she is one of the iciest characters i've read in a book um i i love maggie she is a fabulous character um and i know we're gonna jump to some q a here um mm. but before we do uh one character that i did not really get to touch on uh, as much as i would like it <laughs> is georgina uh, so, <laughs> I, mean, I, I know that the inquiring minds want to know uh where mm where does the legend of this ogress come from is this is this um from stories that you heard growing up or is this something that when you fall into this magical realism and these stories as a way for you to personally process mm -hmm. you know through these fantastical you know nature of storytelling like where where did she where was she born okay uh wicked sister Dwassons was was always a part of uh, high mythology. She was more of a, a Kardashian character. Um, so she <laughs> very concerned about her appearance and you know and how she could leverage that into a like a, a good marriage. And um, you know, so she she like her one of her names was uh, suspiciously married many times. Um, and in our traditional stories, like we get actually had eaten a couple of her husbands. Um, so, so they had a, a, a bad history together already. Uh, but Joasson's was, um, you know, there was uh, the ogress, you know, she wasn't an ogress in our traditional stories, but the ogress in a, um, the, the wild woman of the woods, uh, she would pretend to be an old woman and, uh, if kids tried to go near her and help her, she'd pick them up and put them in her basket. Um, so, so the old woman's form, yeah. And then when she got you somewhere she could eat you, she would show you her ogre's form, which was, you know, terrifying. Um, so that was what, uh, you know, like we get was always going to be like very long lived but his sister wouldn't be because she didn't have that kind of supernatural ability um and you know she was going to age her looks were going to fade um uh, and there are consequences to magic and there are huge consequences to bad magic there's huge consequences to using magic selfishly uh and one of those you know and uh, in the universe that I've created, 
um, you know, the more you abuse magic, like the more it changes you physically. So that's what happened with um, Joasim slash Georgina. So she's moved into a, a state of being that's solely focused on consuming other beings' magic, whether they be strong, whether they be weak. So she does a, you know, she does it in a number of different ways. And she's been looking for um, a, a baby trickster uh, in amongst all of me gets kids. Uh, because tricksters have, in, in my universe, tricksters are able to move through universes. Um, and, you know, I went through this Stephen Hawking phase. <laughs> was absolutely fascinated with um you know it, it was just yeah so that that made it into the book mm -hmm. but um but not in the way I thought it would I I want to talk about simultaneous universe <laughs> like <laughs> we're playing but I'm seeing some questions come in, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give uh, other people a chance um, Elizabeth is uh, curious, listening to you describe ownership of stories, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you would speak more about ownership. Is it individual, family-based, communal, a mix of one or all of these, depending on its context and mm -hmm. what the understanding of ownership is in terms of land or water or relational power? Uh, this is very specific to potlatch cultures. Uh, so it's not it's not indigenous wide. It's just on the west coast of British Columbia, uh, parts of Alaska and parts of Washington. So in potlatch culture, um, the most central tenant is um, uh, communal sharing. And you know it's it's a it's a culture of service. So when our people um, have big names, uh, when, when I see big names, I, I don't know if, if you, you guys have the context for it. I, I just assume that everyone knows about college culture. Because <laughs> I grew up completely surrounded by it. So I mm -hmm. assume everyone knows the ins and outs of it. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail. Uh, but it's, um, so there are many different times that you potlatch in during your life. Um, Sorry, that's my neighbor's good life car. It's very loud. Uh <laughs> but is it painted like the Vancouver Canucks, this car? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so in, in the books there, uh, Jared's aunt drives a beetle that is decked out as a Canucks fan who can deck out their car. So my apologies. Um, please yeah, continue. She's, she's definitely a knuckle head. Um, but the, um, so when we talk about ownership, it's a, it's a very different concept because of the community focus. Um, the people who own the land um, don't own it. They're caretakers. You, you can't own the land. That doesn't make any sense. Um, the land is its own self. Uh, you support the land, and the land supports you. So we had something called Huawei's, uh, and that was the the waterway basin. So, for instance, I live on Smotsa, uh, which is the main house of reserve, and the Huawei, the the watershed, um, uh, the you know the people that were responsible for this part of the land. Um, you know, every single point in our in this territory has a story attached to it. And the stories are attached to names. So uh, because we were a hierarchical society, um, uh, there are some names that you inherit. Those names um, are the big names. And there are some names that go back in the treasure box. Those are um, uh, like you have the chiefs, the high ladies, the nobles, and the commoners. So my name straddles the the gray area between 
uh, noble and commoner think Fergie, not Diana. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so my name, my my traditional name, will go back into the treasure box. Um, you know, it, it, I I like my level of name because you know I don't have a lot of rights, but I also don't have a lot of responsibility. Like, you know, I show up, I peel the carrots before the potlatch, you know, I serve, I, I give the gifts out, you know, um, I witness, uh, whereas people with big names, you know, are responsible for caretaking the land, they're responsible for making peace within the clans, they're responsible for organizing the events, they're responsible for um, getting things done. And you have to learn a lot. Um, so the, the variety of names is, is very broad, but the two basic categories are inherited names and names that go back into the treasure box. Um, and the stories that have uh, ownership under the high, traditional kinds of a copyright are the stories that go with the big names. Like the and stories that, yeah. Sorry, you had mentioned that there are also not just the stories, but there are also songs and dances that yes. go along with those names. Yeah. And, and so yeah. It, it is yeah. very, yeah, layered. It's complex. And, yeah. So if you want, if you want to sing like a particular song, you have to figure out the ownership first. Uh, and then once you figure out the ownership, you have to go through the protocol to ask permission to sing that song. Sometimes people will give blanket permission to sing a song. Like there's, uh, like we have laments for mm -hmm. people who have passed, and usually they're sung at memorials or settlement feasts. And sometimes the owner of the song can say, "I, I give permission to the community to sing this at memorials and you know at settlement feasts." So you don't have to come ask me anymore. This is a song that I created um, when I was in the Mungo Martin dance group in Victoria, uh, there was a gentleman who wrote a lament for his son who had committed suicide. And he gave permission to families of pe to people who had committed suicide to sing this particular song. So um, you, you know, so when you, when you create something, uh, you have ownership of it. Um, but you can give permission, blanket permission, you can give like limited permission. Um, there's songs, you know, uh, there are very specific dances that go with uh, the big names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to dance that dance, then you would have to go through like the same thing, like the Heisler copyright. So, um, and you know there are like uh there's like i wrote a book called monkey beach mm -hmm. and monkey monkey beach is an actual place and it's um it's actually a number of different places the the main beach is called awamosis and it's considered a communal area because um, everybody uses it so there's five different kinds of clams and two different kinds of cockles. There's uh, crabs, there's seals, there's wolves, there's deer, there's, you know, it's just, it's a huge uh, resource. So if someone owned it, it would get very awkward. Uh, but there are people who caretake the areas around it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people who uh, who know the stories and there are people and there's you know that is one of the places where if you want to see a Sasquatch or as they like to be known wild men of the woods <laughs> then Monkey Beach would be the place to go because that's a place that's deeply attached to the story like that's where our last sighting was mm -hmm. um, I love and that's man of the woods he is oh fantastic. thank you fantastic fantastic <laughs> <laughs> this is time, Eden. Um, I just want to, there's two uh, quick questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we started a little bit late, um, so but we are going to wrap up soon, but I just wanted to throw these out there. I know you're writing something on the band council, some trashy, trashy book, but 
<laughs> Lisa is wondering, uh, besides that, what, what else are you working on? Do you have something in progress? Is that the uh, next project? Uh, I'm not sure if it's the next project. It has, like, I'll know when I start getting obsessive. Um, so, for, you know, it has been a summer of just getting, like, my physical self back in, mm. uh, back in order. I have two different kinds of arthritis. They're both rheumatoid. Uh, one is polymyalgia rheumatica. So if you've ever had a frozen shoulder, it, it freezes both your shoulders and it, uh, it got so bad it froze my knees. Uh, so when you, have a, when you have a frozen shoulder, your muscles tend to harden around it to perfect, to, you know, to protect the inflamed area. Uh, so once the inflammation went down, I, I did a lot of physio for my shoulders, but I found it very painful. So I didn't want to do my knees at the same time. If you've ever had knee surgery, um, the, the, the process I was going through this summer, it was uh, a physio, ultrasound, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and a lot of- A little less writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so when, when you're going through something that physical, I think it's okay yeah. to like take, take a break because the things you're creating at that point well, there, there, there isn't a lot of creating going on. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, focusing down. It's what I needed to do. You know, we can't really do anything up here. Like we've had so many waves of COVID that it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll just focus on getting better. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know we, we, said we, we don't want to focus too much on the television series. Um, we want to focus on the books themselves. We have had a couple mm -hmm. questions come in just in relation to that. And I wondered, um, uh, this came in anonymously, so I'm not sure who to credit, but uh, just saying they absolutely love your characters. And Aww. curious what it's like to see those stories and characters translate it to the scene. I thought that was maybe the, the same oh. the television related. <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange. Um, and, you know, it, it does show the difference between novels and film and television. Like film and television, are so much more collaborative. You are you are depending on like a lot of people. Like there's there's lighting, there's camera, there's uh, there's actors, there's you know it, it's just like with novels. Um, you know I have pictures of the characters in my head, but, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know I I you know I hear them speak in a certain way. And uh, I remember I was dating a playwright. And he was the he was the one who actually helped me with my dialogue a lot. Like he he was the one who taught oh. me to sound. Yeah, he was the one who taught me how to to sound it out. And when I didn't get why a piece of dialogue was clunky, he would have his his actor friends interpret it for me. And hearing it through someone else, you know, told me like when the dialogue was being clunky. That's so when different. It was, when it was yeah, it's a it's yeah, a, to it's hear a, it spoken than to read. It's like yeah. poetry. Sometimes it looks really yeah. beautiful on the page. Yeah. It doesn't have the same impact when it's spoken aloud. Yes, so yes. Spoken it's spoken okay. poetry. Yeah. Spoken poetry is a very different set of craft skills. Yeah. Yeah. Um and you know when you when you when you have someone else interpreting your spoken word poem, they'll put emphasis on different places, but they'll always bring something new and exciting to, you know, to the work. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it is a great honor. It is, it is honestly, um, you know, one of the moments where uh, you know, like as as a novelist, like I'm I'm here in my apartment. You know, I don't see anybody. Like I, you know, you get some fan mail, but you know, you you really don't know how people are interpreting, uh, you know, your novels or your work. Uh, whereas with television, you know pretty well right away. <laughs> like there's a there's a re there's an almost instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So they did okay uh, with the, with the casting and and yeah. whole, yeah. handing over creative control of that wasn't yeah wasn't the end of the world for you. No, no, the end of the dolphin all. universe. 
uh, there was, you know, um, I, I had tried to write the script for Monkey Beach, uh, and I think in the early 2000s, the early aughts, and that experience was very humbling. Um, I realized that it was, wasn't something I enjoy, and uh, I had basically replicated the novel. Like I'd, I'd written like a 300 page screenplay. <laughs> And yeah, when I saw, you know, the other adaptations of it, I, you know, I immediately understood what they were trying to do because I banged my head against it for so long, trying to figure out uh, exactly how to do what I wanted to do. Uh, and it's, you know, there are, there are some writers who can like genre hop like crazy. And I know that Emma Donoghue's Room, mm -hmm. uh, I am so amazed by her her adapting her own novel like that that it, and it was a really good adaptation uh, I don't think my brain can do that so you know so I will have to depend on other people to adapt my work I love um, that, though, I, I that wish, recognition yeah. that you know you had said earlier in our conversation that it's that recognition mm -hmm. of knowing what you're really great at and yeah. I think when we're speaking, you say, you know, like characters are my jam. And, and that's <laughs> what it is. So, uh, it's, it's, oh, it's been such an honor and a privilege to chat with you today. Um, oh, thank you. Return of the Trickster, Eden Robinson. Uh, I'm going to hand things back over to Era. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in the audience oh. for us. <laughs> um, thank, thank you, you so much, so much uh, Trisha and Eden. Um, such a pleasure, and um, I'm sure that uh, the audience will agree it was certainly worth waiting for. And um, you know, I, I wish we could just keep going, but uh, I appreciate the the generosity of the time that you've given to us today. Um, we did do a book draw, so I'd like to congratulate our winner, uh, Dion Nolan, who has won a copy of uh, Eden's Return of the Trickster with its absolutely beautiful color cover. Um, Isn't that? Uh, again, a reminder to visit our official bookseller, Novel Idea, for copies, um, and they're available to purchase in store by phone or online. And if you're joining us from outside of the Kingston region, we'd encourage you to visit your local bookseller and pick up a copy. Um, and once again, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us and supporting Kingston Writers Fest. We do have one more event uh, happening today and that's at seven o'clock and that's with uh, Ronaldo Walcott on property. Um, it should be a fascinating discussion. So I do encourage you to join us for that. And uh, once again, thank you so much.